it's always interesting for me to, to go through a, a time of, oh, I don't know, I guess you'd say challenges, a time of growth, a time of development, where I get the opportunity to maybe talk about things that other people won't talk about, share things that other people don't share, you know, and to be real with you and with my God and with my Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there are times where in writing, <laughs> I use the very direct methodology that Jesus said. I let my yes be yes and my no be no. And based upon a lot of information that people throw out when it's not scriptural and not right, you know, I can say that, no, that's not in the Bible, and, you know, that offends some people. And then they, <laughs> they are on the internet, they could always Google it and find it, you know, but they would rather hide the fact that they made it up than to deal with the fact that we all can research and look it up and find out the truth. And I guess that's what Jesus meant when he said that. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than the light, lest their deeds be brought to the light and they be, see, be seen of what manner they are. Because, you see, when a person is open, you know, before the Lord, and when they really understand who God is and who Jesus is, and they have Jesus in their heart, they have no pride. They have no real ego because they know God sees them in all of their sin, in all of their wicked ways. I mean, if anything, the more that you become a Christian, the longer, the more wicked you realize how evil you are. You know, your flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. I mean, God constantly brings out more and more and digs deeper and deeper into the yuck of your innermost being and discovers all the book, you know, and he brings it to the surface so that he can remove it far from you. And that's kind of what your body does anyway. It's like with cell development and you know, when you're building up muscles from fat, you know, and it has to take out all this stuff, you know, and put it in the blood system, and the blood system has to dump in the kidneys, kidneys has to dump in the urinary tract, the urinary tract has to dump it out, you know, as waste. And you have to kind of like clean all the other areas out too. Well, in your life, you know, a lot of times God has to do that. And I know, for me, I was amazed recently that, you know, I, I had been writing and sharing with this person and it came at me and said that I had such this huge ego and <laughs> I must be full, so full of pride and I must be so, you know, egomaniacal, you know, as to claim, much less to say that, you know, God can speak to you, that Jesus could actually, you know, speak in an audible voice as well as, you know, in the scriptures, like when he... You open up a Bible, you know, in your, in your studies, he's speaking to you and it stands out, you know, the, the old King Jameth way of saying it, the way that Spurgeon spoke or the way that some of the older writers used to say is that God would quicken the word to you. And quicken just meant that you went like, you took, it caught your breath, it caught your attention, it made you look, you know, it was one of those gotchas from the Holy Spirit. And that's what it means, really, is a gotcha. It's kind of like a gestalt of spiritual reality it comes into the Word of God and it becomes alive to you in a way that you go, oh, look, and your eyes get bigger and you go, I never saw that before. When did they put that in there? And God, in his way of connecting the synopsis of your brain, which is like, you know, an electrode and there's chemicals in between and it goes zip, zip, little electrical impulses going back and forth. That's how thought is. And he goes, ching, ching, you know, makes a connection and you go, oh, only he does it from your physical part here to your spiritual part somewhere that you can't see. And it suddenly connects all the dots and you go, ah, I get it. I see. You do. And that's what happens when God speaks to you through his word. Now, he also said and promised that as you learned his word and as you discovered who he was and as you grew in that way of knowing him, that he would come to you personally and audibly speak with you physically, that he would 
cause you to hear his voice. And as it says in the proverb, harden not your heart, lest you hear his voice. And that when he does speak, you know, don't harden your heart. And for those of us who were ignorant that we couldn't hear God speak, <laughs> that weren't taught that we weren't supposed to, you know, know that Jesus meant what he said. Well, some of us, just because the Holy Spirit decided to do it, not because we were anything special, God spoke to us direct, you know, and shoot, I always thought it was natural, you know, and <laughs> growing up in the Jesus movement with all the other people around me, it seemed pretty natural to me. <laughs> Everybody else seemed to be saying it, so I figured they did too, and for most of them, I'm sure they did, but in the latter years of my life now that, you know, it's been 35 years, I have found that there are lots of people that God hasn't spoken to or that they don't want to hear what God has to say, you know, or what God may be speaking to them. And so when they tell me that God speaks to them, I always ask them, well, then, you know, what's he told you lately? You know, what did he tell you today? And sometimes they really get offended. But, you know, if I have an ego, you know, it would be ridiculous, you know, to even think that because of my circumstances situation, being disabled, being a person who had to fight out of his disability and conquer it in going forward and working anyways, you know, and hide my disability and hide the fact that I had an ostomy and sometimes it would, you know, cause an accident to happen and I would be shamed by it, you know, in normal job that people do and I would have to sneak off somehow and you know get cleaned up or you know come up with some fancy excuse or some way of you know not just coming clean and telling everyone hey you know I had an ostomy and I got an accident like I do now it's like hey you know what I'm disabled you know in all my glory <laughs> then I laugh at people now because when I was younger I did have an ego, and now that I don't have one, it's like, then I'm accused of one, and I laugh at it because it's so foolish, you know, to think that in me, because of the things that I share from the Lord about hearing God speak, or that, you know, God did it, I didn't have anything to do with it, it wasn't some magical formula or some righteousness of mine, but it was, you know, his own choice and his mercy that he spoke to me, and he does, and still does, and even still saves me, you know, and, and the the older you get as a Christian, the more you know that, you know, you're, the grace of God is so applied that he giveth more grace, you know, to you as you live longer. Because you just learn to abide in him and let him do his thing, you know. And you're just kind of kicking back and letting him speak through you at times and, you know, share with people. And I don't know, you know, sometimes when people talk about my ego, I go, you know, do you think so? Because I am prolific in my writing that I want to put the Word of God out everywhere I can, that there's so many blogs, so much writing, that at every opportunity I spend all my waking moments talking about Jesus and communicating the revelation that He is the Son of God and that He has come into this life and He is alive and well and living in each one of us and that we all communally have a part of Jesus in us that he is trying to work out through us to show us the love that we should have for one another in that we would be proving that we are disciples indeed in that we love each other and that we can communicate that to the world by just demonstrating the simple things that we do anyways as a body of believers that have come together in the fellowship and the unity of his Holy Spirit as we have come together for worship and rejoicing and to pray for one another and to encourage one another and to exhort one another in the word and to be in one accord is that ego? <laughs> I think ego is the guy that runs out there and names it and claims it, you know, or prophesies or does some ridiculous statements that, you know, you go, hey, you know, it doesn't really sound like a scripture to me. <laughs> and then you check it and it's, it's not. <laughs> it isn't even close. <laughs> okay. But I appreciate, and I guess I should thank the person for giving me the opportunity to even share and devotional you know about my ego is that hey you know that was given up 35 years ago when I got saved 
from that moment on, God destroyed me in so many, many ways, from death to life to, you know, rising up through the ranks and jobs to being cast down from jobs to not being attached to the things of the world and not being attached to the people of the world and not being attached to the ministers of God that are supposed to always be right, right? <laughs> For to be attached to any other thing except Jesus Christ and to be so in love with Him and to always seek Him in everything that He would love back in such a way that you would have an intimacy that you could always trust in Him with all of your heart. That you don't have to have <laughs> concerns over your own pride and egotism because believe me there's a lot of ego out there and American Christianity is full of it because we're really told to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him and a lot of people forget the deny part but heard about the take up cross part but they do follow him. so you know they're working on it the best they know how in the best way that they can and sometimes you know maybe Maybe I have a little slippage of ego, you know, maybe my my pride in what God has done over all these years in working out his salvation in me. Except I, sometimes I feel farther away than I feel closer. <laughs> but maybe my pride in some way of how grateful I am that he's given me grace and not the law. And that I can say, oh, thank God for grace. <laughs> You made me so dependent upon grace, God forbid that I would ever think that there should be a righteousness of the law. Uh, no, thank you. I'll take grace and have him impute to me his righteousness than to dispute the idea that somebody could perfect themselves in righteousness to become perfect. Huh. Good luck. <laughs> that, to me, is egotism. But in recognizing that we all bear our own cross, that we all walk our own walk, and that each one of us will be accountable to Jesus face to face for ourselves alone, much less for the things we've done to our family, our friends, our neighbors, our church, our relatives, our wives, our <laughs> exes, our stepchildren, children, whatever they may be, or whoever it may be that you have in your life that we are all accountable to Jesus for that, then I think that knowing we must crucify our flesh and recognize that God is at work in us to accomplish his purposes, it makes it a lot less concerning to me about someone accusing me of ego as it is that I would rather take the accusation and make it a realization that Thank God he has given us his Holy Spirit that we can ask him to reveal to us the truth of anyone who becomes an accuser of the brethren. Because our salvation is assured and our condemnation has been put far from us. But the realization of the flesh and the reality of the body we live in can always stand some extra scrutiny from God himself. If it so be that maybe somebody comes into your life that wants to point a finger, wag a tongue, and if you look those up in the scripture, you know where they come from, <laughs> and make some type of concern that you need not have, but rather a conforming of yourself into allowing God to do as he chooses to either provide the extra confirmation if it is that you're dealing with ego or the humorous realization that you got to be kidding me me <laughs> okay oh well you just need to get a sense of humor and I think that if you watch these videos you'll know that the last person with you know ego looking around at what I own and who I am would be me. <laughs> oh, far be it for me to be considering myself more than I am. Jeez, the sinner saved by grace. Much like you. 
Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains a single grain. But if it dies away in the ground, the grain is freed to spring up in a plant bearing many grains. Go to the old burying ground in Northampton, Massachusetts, and look upon the early grave of David Bernard, beside that of Jerusha Edwards, whom he loved but did not live to wed. And the story goes on and on about a Puritan named Jonathan Edwards, and a lot of people don't know these names, so I probably won't reveal them to you and talk about them much, but to say the Holy Spirit took these men's lives just as they were, imperfect, and inspired others by their imperfections to go out and become missionaries into the world. And a great missionary outreach was started by them. And so never doubt what God has brought into your life and told you to do, even if others may not understand why you do or try to challenge you in what you're doing. Because when you will stand before Jesus, he's not going to ask you what you did for him, but he's just going to say, do you know me? And if you do, then you know that he told you to do what you did. So you don't have to fear whether or not you have the acceptance of men, but rather you have the confirmation of God. And when you do, the works that you do will be anointed and they will bear fruit, though you may not see it in your lifetime. It will still be accomplished in the timing, the will, and the way of the Lord.